Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome back. So let's continue our discussions on exclusion processes and so on. So yesterday, uh, this microphone, okay. <coughs> Uh, maybe first we can review what we learned yesterday a little bit. So general idea is that uh, suppose we have some kind of microscopic dynamics, then we are interested in macroscopic behaviors of such systems. And uh, in general, if we can solve the microscopic system exactly, then we are, we are very happy. But in many cases, it's difficult. So in many cases, we are just happy to have hydrodynamic description. And the most famous one is the Navier-Stokes equation in Newton dynamics, right? But uh, this is deterministic uh, evolution equation. So it is not enough to study fluctuations. Um, but uh, in sometimes we could try to add some noise term to the hydrodynamic equation to study fluctuation. This is the basic story. And uh, now we are considering this kind of story for very, very concrete models, which has stochastic dynamics. So yesterday, uh, we introduced uh, ASEP and uh, some similar related models on one dimensional lattice. So com compared to Newton dynamics in three dimensions, this is much, much sim simplified version. But still, we can try to do something similar. Right? And then the hydrodynamic descri description of ASIF is basically Varga's equation. Yeah, so in general, we have p minus q as a coefficient, but uh, this is not very important, especially for the, q, for the Tensei's case, when p is equal to 1, q is equal to 0. So this is the hydrodynamic equation. And then uh, we are also interested in fluctuation. For the case of maybe Tensei, uh, of course, when we study fluctuations, uh, we have to specify initial uh, initial conditions. And the simplest one, from technical point of view, is the step initial condition. So now we start from, we consider the case in which we start from the so-called step initial condition. So all left sides are occupied, all right sides are empty. Then we count the number of particles which cross at the origin, right? So this uh, stochastic random variable is, is denoted by n of t. And uh, oh, sorry, so before that, uh, we can consider hydrodynamics for this particular situation. And as I already mentioned, by solving this Burger's equation, we know how the, the average density profile behaves. And this is the kind of answer. And then, so we are interested in the current at the origin. So at the origin, we have density one half always. So in the large t limit, we it is kind of known that uh, locally around the origin, the situation uh, becomes basically very, very major with density one half. So then, yeah, okay, hydrodynamic. And we are interested in fluctuation. And how this behaves. And as I said, uh, this is kind of known to kind of grow as uh, t to the power one third, not one half. And uh, there's some ra random variable, which is non-trivial, non and uh, this is known to be tr given by trace rhythm distribution, uh, trace rhythm random variable in the large t limit. And uh, maybe today first, I would like to explain how we can establish this, this result for the case of TASIP, right? This is a well-known result, but uh, this is kind of most fundamental result, I think, in this 
integrable probability theory, so let me try to explain it. But, uh, oh, sorry. And the xi goes to trace with on distribution, as I said. And first, I want to explain what is the trace with on distribution by using the node I distributed yesterday. So in our context, so the limiting distribution for the current uh, is given by the trace rhythm distribution, but uh, that distribution appeared uh, uh, for the first time in the context of random matrix theory, in particular for the case of GUE, Gaussian unitary ensemble. So be because you have already nodes, I, I, I want to go very quickly, but uh, let me try to go through. So GUE is a random matrix. So it's a matrix with random elements. So this is random matrix. And there's a particular ca case for which we can do many, many analysis. The, the more kind of most famous one is this GUE, Gaussian Unitary Ensemble. And uh, this is a, first this is a measure for, sorry, the matrix H. So H is a n by n Hermitian matrix, and we, we consider random matrix with the measure given in this form. So H is matrix, we take square, and we take trace, so this is some number, and this is gives you some number again, right? And uh, maybe we can put normalization, yeah, so Z is always normalization constant. This may, uh, exact expression may depend on situation, but uh, maybe uh, basically I use always the same notation, Z. So the meaning you have to think always, depending on the situation. But anyway, so this is the GUE. So we consider N by N Hermitian matrix. And the good thing about GUE is that uh, we can write down explicitly the joint eigenvalue density, right? So suppose XI's are eigenvalues, of GUE random matrix of size n. Then eigenvalues are also random, and the joint eigenvalue density is written explicitly. So it is known to be given by this expression. This is a well-known fact, but of course, uh, to get this formula for eigenvalues starting from this measure for matrix is not completely trivial, right? But uh, of course, uh, this is written in the standard books like Meta, Foresta, and so on for random matrices, but today I just skip. In, in particular, because uh, this measure does not uh, itself is not really playing so much ro role in the connection to stochastic processes, but the uh, measure for the eigenvalues this kind of structure appears often in the context of stochastic processes as well. So anyway, in, in a sense, we can start from this measure for eigenvalues, right? To see a connection to uh, stochastic processes, okay? And uh, maybe we can also put the normalization constant uh, as well. So, um, so this is uh, the so-called well-known uh, product of differences, right? And it is well-known that uh, this can be written as a determinant. <coughs> so basically, so this is a very good structure. I mean, once you have a measure in the form of a product of two determinants, then there is a standard machinery, machinery or theory for, by which you can study various properties of this measure. And uh, th this says that the eigenvalues of G random matrix has particular this structure, right? <coughs> and uh, yeah, so basically in phys physics terms, this, is, this structure is related to so-called free fermions, fermions with kind of free interactions. And this, for this case, 
there are many standard techniques to study. From a, ma more mathematical point of view, this is known to be related to so called determinant of point process or determinant of random point field. Um, but basically, the techniques are similar, and uh, there are many things one can do, right? So, so once you have this structure, determinant times determinant, this is good. Okay. <coughs> and uh, to proceed, well, this is already in such a form, but it is also useful to rewrite this a little bit. in a particular way. So, so this is a Van der Mont determinant. So this has a structure like, like this, right? And of course, uh, even if you add the first row to the second row with arbitrary coefficient, maybe plus alpha, plus alpha, and so on, the determinant does not change. So, and one can do the same thing to to each row. So this means that the determinant does not change e even for arbitrary uh, polynomials, right, for each row. The, the de determinant is the same as the original one. <coughs> and uh, we, we want, oh, sorry. So here we should also add this one. Right? And in this case, because we have Gaussian measure here, it is useful to have polynomials which are orthogonal with respect to this Gaussian measure. And uh, it is well known that uh, such pro polynomials are given by the Hamid polynomial. So b basically we want to take this to be given by a Hamid polynomial. But maybe we can also include this normalization into determinant by separating it into here, here. Then by defining phi and uh, we could also include the coefficient here to get rid of this normalization constant. Now there, there's no one over z, so this is one, right? Anyway, if we take this appropriately and define phi n to be this, this one, uh, Hamid polynomial of nth order of degree times half Gaussian measure, and then, yeah. For example, it is easy to see that uh, if we integrate over all possible values for the eigenvalues, this gives you one. So, so then we, we want to consider n for the integral of uh, x i's of this thing. Then there are two determinants here, but uh, by the identity 1.3, which you proved in the exercise yesterday, this can be written as a single determinant by j. Then because of the choice of phi n, this is uh, just a determinant of identity matrix, so then this is one, right? So in this way, one can easily check that uh, this is, uh, this, this measure is normalized. Okay. Then, uh, the trace rhythm distribution appears at the limit of largest, uh, the, the distribution function for the largest eigenvalue for GUE. Um, since we know already the whole joint eigenvalue densities, it is easy to write down some formula for the distribution function of largest eigenvalue, which is denoted by x max here. Because this function is symmetric with respect to x i, we can take symmetric integral of this measure, right? And then the difference from this checking of the probability one is that uh, now we have here 
kind of restrictions for the integral, but maybe this can be replaced by putting product of n, right? Then, yeah, so then this can be removed. Now, so this is a whole, in whole integral. And then one can use the same identity you proved yesterday. And then <coughs> this can be written as a single single determinant, phi i, phi j, one minus s, right? But uh, maybe you can rewrite this as one minus going to the other way with infinity. Then for this part, you have again this phi i, phi j. So this is. Uh, there's i j, and then comes sorry. <coughs> now, yeah. So this is one expression al already for the largest eigenvalue for G U E. Now one can see this as a kind of matrix. So this one can interpret this as a determinant of one minus a b. Because this, of course, this is a bit tricky because uh, i and j are discrete index, whereas x uh, is continuous. But uh, one can think of this as kind of matrix. So a i x is phi i x, and uh, b i j are similar. And then we can invert this. Then the mat kind, of mat kind of matrix element, so BA, which, which we now denote by K. So because now the role of I and X are swapped, matrix element is now kind of two variable function which can be also called a kernel. And in this case, this is given by x, one, x, y. So now we have the same index for this discrete one. This is summed from zero to, uh, sorry, zero to n minus one. And uh, we have different uh, arguments for x and y. Right? So this can be considered as kernel for this spread home determinant now infinite limit. Yeah, so this formula can be also proved for the case where you know, the matrix size, matrix is not a square. n by n times n, n by n can be inverted to n by n, n times n by n. And uh, if you take kind of continuous limit, you, you get the uh, identity from finite dimensional matrix to the Fred Hunter. Right? Okay, anyway, and uh, if you substitute this definition for phi n in terms of h n, then you get a kernel, Fred, uh, determinant kernel in terms of Hamid polynomial. And then, yeah, for Hamid polynomials that are well-known integral formula, con maybe contour integral formula, something like, uh, <laughs> maybe there are some, Small mistake, but uh, basically this should be like something like this. Then there is a standard technique, with, uh, basically tunnel point analysis, to study asymptotics of these Hamid polynomials. Then, in a certain limit we are interested in, this behaves like a uh, area function. This is this, this is yeah kind of standard asymptotic analysis. Then one can show that uh, this behaves like, so each one, each phi n behaves like airy, right? And uh, there's a kind of running index from here. So then this becomes an integral. In this form. So in this limit, this distribution function uh, 
also have to be scaled, of course. So this is uh, correct scaling for the largest eigenvalue of GUE. Anyway, by using this analysis, one can show that uh, if we take this appropriate scaling for the largest eigenvalue for GUE, so this distribution function tends to some limit, which is given by the Fredholm determinant. Maybe this is denoted by K2. So by this analysis, we can show that uh, this distribution function tends to some Fredholm determinant, and this is a non-trivial distribution function, and this is denoted by F2 of F. And this is the GUE trace rhythm distribution. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so this is a kind of, a kind of short, short way of showing, uh, getting the trace rhythm distribution for the case of random matrix. GUE. And in fact, uh, to show this limit theorem for task F, uh, we can we basically we do very something very, very similar to this. But uh, at some point, we can arrive at an expression which is looks very, very similar to this one, uh, or maybe this one. Mm, this one. At this point, <laughs> then I can just say that by following the same calculations as for the GUE, we can arrive at GUE trace rhythm, right? So the, the point is that, the point is to find some formula which looks like this kind, which includes some measure in this form of a product of determinant. Once we have this kind of formula, measure in the form of, of a product of two determinants, then so this is the standard procedure to arrive at uh, some non-trivial limiting distributions and so on. Right? Okay. So this is for GUE. Now let's come back to the case of TASIP. Again, we just consider a step initial condition. Right? Of course, once we could solve this special case, one, we could consider various generalizations, but uh, from technical point of view, this step case is the most easiest. So first we should start from here. <coughs> then we are interested in distribution functions for the current as the origin. So n of t is random variable, and n is just a, uh, sorry, in this case, uh, because we are considering TASIP uh, with a step initial condition, this can be taken to be non-negative integer. <coughs> right, so this is a distribution function. And the whole, Maybe what we want to show today is that no, okay. So this term means that uh, we take a sum over all x1, x2, blah, 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 xn, starting from n to infinity. Right. So, so this is a kind of uh, first goal of, the, of this today's lecture. Uh, once we arrive at this point, now it, it is obvious that uh, this has a strong similarity to the case of GUE largest eigenvalue, right? Here you see basically identical 
expressions, as in the case of eigenvalues for GUE. The only difference is that uh, now this Gaussian measure is replaced by this kind of Poisson measure. But uh, he, here what I said is that uh, because of this measure of Gaussian, we use Hamid polynomial. Then we can try to do something similar here. And uh, associated with this Poisson measure, uh, there's also non-orthogonal polynomial. So this is given by Charlier orthogonal polynomial. And then by using Charlier polynomial, then we can do exactly the same calculation to arrive at free freedom distribution. So in, in this way, one can show that uh, the current distribution is given by the trace freedom distribution, GV trace freedom distribution in the large T limit. So the problem is to how we can get this formula. Okay, so there are several ways. And so this is a uh, result first obtained by Johansson two, um, 20 years ago. And uh, he, used, he used a combinatorial argument. First, he considered discretized version of passive, and then he mapped the, com mapped the dynamics of TASIF to a problem of uh, knowing negative integer matrix. And uh, here he doesn't use, he, because this is a kind of discrete matrix, he cannot really uh, diagonalize this matrix, and this is not useful. But instead, he used uh, so-called RSK, robinson schenfeld knuth algorithm, to again map a problem to some another combinatorial problem of Young tableau. And then Young combinatorial combinatorics of Young tableau is related to Schuer function. And then by taking some limit, he could arrive at this formula, right? But uh, today, uh, I don't use that path, but uh, yeah, by slightly different method, we would arrive at this formula. Okay. okay. So Today, the basic uh, quantity we want to use is the transition probability. Maybe also, this can be also a green function. For general ACIF, in fact, basically, at least today, we are only interested in the case of TASIF, in which T is equal to one, Q is equal to zero. But at least for this, up to some point of this part, the argument uh, runs very parallel, in a parallel fashion. And maybe it is even better to work for the ACIF. So let me explain <coughs> a little bit for the general ACIF. And then we specialize to the case of TASIF. And uh, as I said, we, by, change, by rescaling time, we can fix one parameter of ACIF, P and Q. And uh, at least today, we put one condition that P plus Q is equal to one, which simplifies many formulas in the following. Okay, so what is the transition probability? So this is a probability that uh, at the beginning, at time T equals zero, we have ACIP particles at uh, positions Y1, Y2, blah, 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 Yn. So they are order, right? And then, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is related to the exercise problem yesterday for the case of TASIF, but uh, yeah, anyway. And uh, at time t, t equal t, they may be at positions x1, x2, blah, 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 x, xn. So, because of the exclusion interaction, of course, uh, the order is not changed here. Then, so we consider the case of n particles. And then,
So let x i of t denote the position of the ice particle at time p. Then we can consider the, the conditional probability, probability that at time p equals 0, th they are given by y i. And at time p, they are given by x i. So this corresponds to this situation, right? And this we de denote by g of x t and y of z. x now represents the n variable here. And so y i are initial positions, but in many cases we can we we focus on x i. So in that sense, sometimes we abbreviate this uh, y dependence. So in, this, in that case, we simply write this as a function of x and t. Yeah, so sorry that, that this kind of notation appeared in the exercise yesterday, which may have confused you a little bit. Uh, how can we find some expression for this probability? A good idea? For, for example, in the case of one, one particle, so this is just a random walk, right? So how would you try to find the expression for this case? In the case of random matrix, uh, sorry, random walk, maybe we can again discretize time and just consider uh, the count, count the number of paths which, come, which start from some position and end that position. That, that's one possibility. But uh, in continuous time, there's another way, right? So maybe one can write down the evolution equation for this, for this quantity with respect to time. And then maybe one can try to solve it. And uh, it should also satisfy the initial condition. And yeah, by, by doing this, we can find some expression. And in principle, we can try to do something similar for n particle case. What is the evolution equation for this case? So this kind of e evolution equation for this kind, kind of probability is known to be, has a name of Kolmogorov forward equation. In many cases, in probability theory, people are uh, more interested in, uh, people use more often the Kolmogorov backward equation. But uh, if we consider this probability itself, uh, we, we use also forward equation. And in physics, this is often called mass equation. Okay, what is the equation? When this condition is satisfied, namely when particles are far uh, uh, apart, so there is, there's at least one space difference. I mean, uh, yeah, there are some gaps for all the consecutive particles. Then the dynamics is basically just a sum of independent random walkers. So in this case, equation is very simple. That is simply given by this equation. So this means that uh, So this configuration happens when a particle comes to position xj with rate p from xj minus 1. 
And this is a case particle hops to the left with wave Q from Xj plus one. And we, we could also, we should also think about the kind of escape rate. So from, from this position, maybe this particle hops to the right with wave P. And this particle may hop to the left with wave Q. So this is, and P and Q is now taken to be one. So, so this is uh, es escape rate, right? And uh, we have to consider all possible particles. So this is a sum. So this is the evolution equation for this case. So this is very simple. This is just an independent Walker case. But of course, uh, we should put some ex exclusion condition. There are two particles. Which are on neighboring sides, like this. Then the equation becomes different. Because uh, this particle cannot hop to the, to the right. This particle cannot hop to the left. Right. And in this case, case, so there is a contribution from this hop, contribution from this hop, they are here and here, and there's also contribution from this one and this one, this is here, and of course uh, for other particles, I mean J which is not equal to I or I plus one, we have the same uh, contribution like here. So, so this is a evolution equation for this case. But uh, so this is the case in which there are only two, partic two particles on neighboring side. And maybe we have to also consider the case where uh, there are three particles on neighboring side and four particles on neighboring side. So this is now getting pretty complicated. But uh, in principle, this is something you have to do. Anyway, so these are the evolution equations for the case of A sets, right? For this print function. And uh, of course, the transition probability also should satisfy the initial condition. This is simply given by a pro product of the Kronecker delta of xj and yj. Sorry. So, yeah. <coughs> There's also an issue of uniqueness. And, uh, in this case, we can also show it, but uh, 
maybe I don't discuss it here. So basically, we, sub we think that uh, if we can find some, some formula for G, which satisfies the evolution equation there and the initial condition, then that should be the Green's function, transition probability. We can try to solve this as this is, but uh, in fact, th this part is a bit nasty, right? But uh, there's a kind of slightly nicer way of describing this condition of exclusion. So suppose we put, so there's a kind of um, separation of cases into this, this, this case and this case and so on, right? So maybe we can try to put this condition in this case, right? Then, of course, the problem is that if we put this kind of condition in this equation, in some cases, we see a term like gxx. X. That are in some, at some point, we get uh, two coinciding arguments, which is unphysical, of course. We are considering passive, so they are strictly ordered. But uh, if we put this kind of condition into here, uh, we get this kind of term of coinciding arguments. So this is unphysical, but uh, because f physically this does not really appear, maybe we can arbitrarily take some value for this coinciding argument in such a way that uh, with some condition in this equation, maybe this equa equation appears. So instead of considering case by case, maybe we can put some boundary condition for this, for the case where two arguments are crossed, basically coinciding, so that we can always use this equation with some boundary condition for this coinciding point. In fact, one can check that this condition one B can be Replaced by this condition. <coughs> so now our problem is to solve the evolution equation, which is given by this simple formula, and boundary condition, which is given here, and it should also satisfy this initial condition. How can we solve this problem? The basic method you learned al already this morning in, in the lecture by Paul, it's in Justin. So we try to use a beta and that. Of course, uh, because we are considering uh, many sort of many body systems, in general, it's impossible to solve such, such equations, right? And there are not basically <laughs> only a few techniques to study such interactive systems o o already in one-dimensional case, and the uh, most standard techniques is uh, this beta and uh, And uh, in fact, this works also for this ASIP case. So, in the case of Paul, he used, he explained the so-called algebraic beta ansatz, which is more sophisticated and more algebraic. 
but uh, in my lecture, I use uh, kind of more simpler version, you know, called, called coordinate rate angle. But uh, yeah, Th they are equivalent anyway. So maybe first we want to rewrite the problem in a slightly different way. So concretely, these are the equations we want to solve. But um, more formally, maybe we can write this evolution equation in this form, right? After all, so these uh, can be considered as kind of matrix elements, right? So this is linear equation. So this can be considered as kind of linear equation. First order linear equation in this form. So L star explains, uh, co contains the information about the dynamics. P, Q at some position, right? But anyway, this can be written in this way. And of course, uh, this notation is coming from the adjoint generator, which appeared also in the yesterday's lecture. They are basically the same. Of course, the actual representation is slightly oh. different from yesterday, because we are considering now n particle sector only, but uh, they are basically the same thing. And uh, if we re rewrite this evolution equation in this way, and now we are saying that uh, this is just a matrix, right? Then to solve this equation, what we have to do is to try to <laughs> diagonalize this matrix first. So instead of considering this DDT itself, of course we, this is basically equivalent to consider eigenvalue problem for the same matrix L star. So psi is now eigenvector, or kind of function, so this is eigenvalue. Yeah, so in, in the lecture by Paul, so he was considering uh, well, maybe yeah, transfer matrix P, and uh, he wanted to, he, he showed how to diagonalize this uh, transfer matrix, right? And uh, in the yesterday's exercise of Paul, there was uh, some exercise in which you showed one plus, I don't know, something like, uh, if you take some limit, so this transfer matrix contains some um, Hamiltonian of FFT. Then diagonalizing trans by trans by diagonalizing transfer matrix, you are uh, at the same time diagonalizing Hamiltonian HFFT, and uh, this can be done by algebraic creator and that, as you learned this morning. And in fact, HFFT is almost identical. <laughs> to this L star for A set. So then, naturally, one can apply the creator and that. In, in my lecture, I use the so-called coordinate creator and that. He used uh, algebraic creator and that, but they are identical. But anyway, <coughs> so this is the connection to Paul's lecture. Now we use creator and that. So first, we postulate that uh, what kind of of expression this eigenfunction has. So we, we suppose that uh, probably we can find some eigenfunction for our problem in the form given in this formula. In the case of one variable, when n is equal to one, so this is just uh, this is just some coefficient times p one to k. This gives you p1 to the power x1. So this is basically just a Fourier mode. 
And uh, for one particle case, of course, a uh, random walker problem can be studied by, can be solved by using Fourier expansion. So this corresponds to this part. But the question is what, how we can solve it for any particle case. And this is highly not trivial, but uh, so Bete, almost 100 years ago, thought that uh, maybe eigenfunction can be found in this particular form. Of, uh, eigenfunction, right? So for the case of n equal 2, <laughs> no, no. I, I think I will, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I explain n equal 2 case shortly, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so this, in this, in this form, in this form, we try to find eigenfunction, right? So yeah, let's do it really explicitly. For n equal one case, yeah. For those who are not familiar with beta and dust, I think we should do this. So this is the eigenvalue equation for one particle case. And uh, according to this beta and thus, we try to find eigenfunction in the form of t to the power x. Then, in fact, uh, if you substitute this into this equation, then you see that basically this is already an eigenfunction. If we take the eigenvalue in this form, p over z plus qz minus one. Yeah, very simple. N equal two case is the most non-trivial case. This is the uh, fourth equation. And then we also put boundary condition. Right, so, so these are, sorry, so these two equations are the equations we want to solve. And according to this beta and that, we put the eigenfunction form in the following way. Right. So this is a uh, sum of uh, permutations. So for the case with n equal two, there are only two terms, like this one and this one, and the coefficients are denoted by a12 and a21. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, if we have only one term, this is just a uh, Fourier mode for the two particle case. So this works for two independent walker, but uh, because of the interaction, this is not enough. And uh, when there's some interaction, of course. Uh, there are some uh, effects for x1 and x2, and maybe we should we take some contribution from swapped, uh, swapped okay, Fourier mode, right? So, so and we put just put some coefficients here. Then we can check that uh, this works. In this in this particular form, we can find eigenfunction. <coughs>
from the first equation, one can simply see that uh, the eigenvalue should be taken to be just a sum of uh, the eigenvalues for one particle case for Z1 and Z2. This you can check easily from the first equation. And then the, the non-trivial condition comes from this boundary condition, which is related to interaction, it's crucial interaction between the two particles. And then if you substitute this beta and that wave function into this boundary condition, then you can see that uh, the condition is given this way. So this boundary condition tells us that uh, we should take the ratio to be given by this particular form. Yeah. Of course, uh, there is one arbitrary arbitrariness for uh, constant, so, so only the ratio matters. So yeah, anyway, the ratio is given in this way. Right. And then we can try to see <laughs> what happens for general n equal three case and so on. But one can check that uh, this basically works for general n. And uh, if we take uh, this A sigma appropriately, right, and uh, we can check that basically A sigma for general sigma can be written as a kind of product of these two particle so called S matrix. And the final formula. By doing basically the same calculation for general A n case, one can see that uh, if we take A sigma to be this form, then this is the eigenfunction for the adjoint, agent, adjoint generator for A set. In the case of lecture by Paul, he also imports the so called beta and the equation. But uh, here we don't have to use that because uh, now we are considering infinite system, system on T. Whereas in the Paul's case, he was considering system on a period periodic matrix, right? So in this case, of course, uh, we also have to put periodic boundary condition for the eigenfunction. From here, you get beta and that equation. So if we want, if we want to solve, study the ACES on peri periodic lattice, we also have to consider beta and that equation. But uh, for the moment, we are only considering A set on Z. So in this case, we don't have to worry about this. <coughs> All right, so um, this is the eigenfunction. And then,
So our aim was to find some formula for the transition probability. And now it is easy. W once we write down <laughs> this eigenfunction, it's now very easy. Uh, it is simply given by a very simple sum, some, int uh, some simple integral of this eigenfunction. Basically, uh, the transition probability uh, should be a kind of superposition sum of the eigenfunctions with appropriate coefficients, right? And we, we this should satisfy the initial condition as that's a product of delta Kronecker uh, delta, and uh, in fact, it is easily taken into account by putting yj here. So basically, naively, if you take, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so this appears from one particle energy. So lambda, this is eigenvalue for the generator, right? And uh, thi this part is basically eigenfunction. And we want to put some coefficient and take a sum, or maybe integral, which satisfies initial condition. And uh, so this is the, the answer. And when t is equal to zero, this disappears. And then basically we want to consider this one. And uh, if we forget about this, this would give us a condition that xj is equal to some, some yj, right? And of course, there's a big sum here. And uh, the fact that we can take this means that basically the case of identity permutation contributes on this one. So in this case, this is just yj, and uh, then this gives this part as the integral gives the delta function. Yes? Integration, and this is, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, so this is just large control. So, so in fact, uh, yeah, in such a way that th there are some z dependence also here, and there are many poles, but we don't want to include. And one can check that if we take these contours to be large enough, then this gives you the correct uh, initial condition. Right. So checking this general case, what, uh, ah, sorry, uh, not, not so <laughs> exercise of two stars. So in the exercise in my corresponding to my lectures, there are some problems with star, right? So star means that uh, basically they are difficult problems. You don't really have, you don't really have, you don't have to solve them, but if you are interested, you are welcome to solve it. And uh, so this is uh, kind of one kind of difficult exercise to check that uh, th this is uh, really the formula, green function formula for a general ACES. And uh, yeah, in fact, uh, this is the uh, one part of the results of the paper of tracing and rhythm on ACES. And uh, if you look at the reference, so there is a reference of tracing and rhythm from 2008. But in addition to that, next as a next reference, I quoted errata, CMP. So this is related to this thing. So if you try to <laughs> check, maybe there are some pitfalls. <laughs> maybe, yeah. So even tracing and rhythm made some mistake, right? <laughs> when checking this. So this is not an easy problem, but uh, we can try. OK. Anyway, so this is the formula for general ACS case. Hmm? What's the order of the degree? Order, order doesn't matter, I think. This is, they, are, they are just a large control. Doesn't matter, I think. Mm. 
Well, not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> some people here are so much used to <laughs> nested contours. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so this is, in a, in a sense, much simpler. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is already for general ACS, but uh, we are uh, yes. So, so I mentioned that uh, there's an issue, and uh, for this case, we can show it, but uh, I don't discuss it here. <laughs> yeah. Of course, yeah. So, so, so which part? So, so the, the evolution equation, boundary condition, and the initial condition. Wh which one are you worried about? The first one? The first one? Uh, so basically, uh, because we are constructing this transition probably to using eigenfunction, uh, the first two conditions, evolution equation and boundary conditions, are automatically satisfied. And uh, the most non trivial part is to check the initial conditions. Huh? And there's a pitfall uh, for which Tracy and Rhythm also made the mistake. <laughs> but uh, one can check it. And the uniqueness issue is I, I don't discuss it. Okay. Okay, so this is for general A set, but uh, for the moment we are simply interested in the path set case. So which corresponds to t equal one, q equal zero. In this case, first maybe we can write down some formula for the eigenfunction. So this is the formula for the eigenfunction for general A set. For the case of the taste step, we take q equals zero basically, and t equal one. And then this disappear. Of course, uh, this quadratic term is pretty nasty for the general A set case. And uh, the fact that they disappear in the limit of taste set so this helps a lot, of course, to study the case of this. Anyway, no, very short. Sorry, no, before the interview. In the case of taste step, the eigenfunction can be written in this form. Okay. Just uh, taking special case of this. Uh, yeah, this is already not completely trivial to check, I thought, but uh, yeah, this you can check. And, uh, <coughs> of course, uh, if you look at this, then you immediately see that uh, this can be written as a single determinant. So for the case of taste step, uh, the eigenfunction is already a determinant. So there is a determinantal formula for the eigenfunction for taste step. And then, so for the transition probability, green function, we also do the same thing like this. We put basically this one, z to the power minus y is here, and take integral to get a transition probability. But uh, in this form, because this is determinant, so each row or each column, are kind of separated so that uh, maybe one can include this integral into the deter in inside of the determinant. Then,
So the transition prob probability can be written as some determinant. And this is written in this form. Sorry, so, so this appears already in the exercise, but uh, in this way one can get the formula. So in, in fact, this, fo uh, yeah, this formula was first found by Schutz. And probably he used this beta angle to arrive at this determinant formula. But uh, he gave a proof, a direct proof, just as in the exercise. You, 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 you did for the case of n equal 2 yesterday. And uh, this is also easy, right? By first maybe writing down some, fo some recursive structure or integral formula for the, this function f. And by using such recursive structure and the properties of the determinant, one can check that uh, this formula satisfies evolution equation, boundary condition, and initial condition rather easily. Yes. So this is the transition probability for a set, a uh, ta set. Okay, so almost at the be beginning of today's lecture, I said that uh, today's goal is to show the GUE-like formula for this uh, distribution function for the current. <coughs> but now, now, now we want to, sh to derive such a formula but by using this determinant uh, condition probability. First, no, so, so this is the distribution function for the current. But uh, now we have, what we have now at hand is this transition probability. So how are they connected? So now, now we are only considering this step initial condition. And uh, we are counting the number of particles which cross the origin up to time t, right? So this is this n t. But uh, if, we, if we look at this trajectory, then this is equivalent to consider the case in which n particle position is to the right of the origin at time t. So then we can use this transition probability to calculate this distribution function, right? <laughs> zero was, sorry, <laughs> I didn't really specify where was the zero or one depending on this notation. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, sorry. So suppose that uh, so this was zero and then this is one. Then now we have uh, some formula for this transition probability. So we take a sum over all possible xi, which satisfies these conditions. Then we can try to take a sum of this, of this determinant. In the general case, it's pretty difficult. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For the moment, I think 
like uh, at some point I wrote a picture like exponent this is a bar x ten. So today I ordered this. Here. Ah. Ah, sorry. Uh, so yeah. So thank you. <laughs> uh, this this is a kind of confusion, right? Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So sorry. <laughs> thank you. So so yeah. It, so this should be so n particle case, but uh, the first one, the leftmost one. Thank you. To prove this formula for general ACE is not so easy, in fact. But uh, you can try. But uh, so maybe you can try only the case of n equal to 2. So then in this case, Yeah, by writing down the this determinant of green function explicitly, and especially for the case of step initial condition, in which yj is uh, like minus yj, minus j, uh, the formula looks like this, and we want to take a sum like this. And then, you know, so xi, x1 appears only here, x2 appears only here. So basically, we want to take a sum of x1 and 2 inside by using some recursive structure of the function f, fn. Uh, but before that, maybe <laughs> what I do is Using the formula in the exercise yesterday, we can rewrite it. So f1 can be written as a sum over f0. And in, a s in the same way, f0 can be written as a sum over f minus 1. So then we can write this. So then, so, so this comes here, right? Then if you compare, now, so yeah, at this point, this is already a nice formula. But uh, so this indi indices. Indices are uh, not so nicely organized. So, so there's no kind of Fred, uh, free uh, fermionic formula. But uh, uh, after using this rewriting one, then we have the same function here and here and here and here. So then there's anti symmetry of the, so we, can, we can use the anti symmetry of the determinant. And then After this, there are some calculations, but I want to explain a little more. So I think I'm sorry that uh, I hope you you, you try to do this calculation. And uh, after some calculations, you can of course arrive at the some calculations, we arrive at this formula for n equal 2 case. And uh, this is the uh, n equal 2 case of the formula I showed you almost at the beginning. So now this has uh, this van der Monde structure and also some potential term. So this is like GUE. And uh, yeah, then by, uh, by doing the same calculation as for GUE, one can go to the trace rhythm distribution. Right. <coughs> Okay, so this is nice. So for the particular case of TASIF, by solving the microscopic model, this model explicitly, we can already study some fluctuations. 
Oh, wieder Modder. But uh, so at the beginning of today's lecture, this is from yesterday, I was saying that maybe we can try to effect the study fluctuations by adding noise to hydrodynamic equations, right? What about that in our case? So of course, now we are studying cases. So probably, uh, no, sorry. This part. Maybe we should try to add noise to the case without, to the Burgers equation without viscosity. But uh, yeah, in fact, I didn't. <laughs> Maybe this is, is not so well suited problem. But usually we, we try to put uh, to add noise to Burgers equation with uh, viscosity. Let's try to do that. Then. So this is the uh, Burgers equation with viscosity. So this is uh, yeah, so this is the uh, Burgers equation, and this is the viscosity term. Yeah. So, so originally this was u minus one minus two, but of course uh, you can shift u to u plus one half or something, and then you get uh, this equation. So this is equivalent. So this is Burgers equation with viscosity. Maybe we can try to add some noise. Right? And uh, noise should be such that uh, it should be inside the derivative. Because uh, so this is basically coming from this kind of continuity equation. And we are thinking that the noise uh, is added as, uh, to, to the current, right? not to the, the density itself. So we put derivative terms here. And xi is, in a standard way, this can be taken to be Gaussian white noise. So the average is zero. And, uh, the covariance is taken to be delta in both x and t. Anyway, so this is a viscous viscous Burgers equation with as, uh, with noise output. So we we can try to study some fluctuation effect of the Burgers equation by studying this equation. But as some people should know, this is basically the KPZ equation. <coughs> For Of so course, this is a so-called noisy Burgers equation. So for the integral of this vari uh, this variable y, so this equation is basically equivalent to some equation for. In this field, there's no derivative term for the noise, and this is the KPD equation. And uh, this KPD equation can be also studied explicitly, exactly, rigorously. And then one can also show that uh, for particular initial condition corresponding to this set initial condition, one can find, for example, the place rhythm distribution. So in this sense, <coughs> Uh, so this is very, we are in a happy situation, right? So we are expecting that, uh, <coughs> we are hoping that by adding some noise to hydrodynamic equation, maybe we can study fluctuation effect of microscopic models. And uh, the fact that the KPZ equation, or noisy Burgers equation, and the TASEP has the same uh, fluctuation behavior in the large time limit says that, uh, yeah, 
this kind of uh, adding noise is pretty effective. This is a useful way of studying fluctuation effects for microscopic models. And uh, this is related to, of course, a kind of so-called universality. Uh, yesterday, I mentioned that uh, for critical for critical phenomena related to phase transition for equilibrium system, there's a well-known notion of universality. We see very, very universal behavior around the uh, phase trans transition point. And even for some non-equilibrium systems, we are expecting to have some strong universality. And uh, this is one manifestation of such universality for non-equilibrium systems. So for various models, we are expecting to see universal limiting distributions and the correlation in the large P limit. Right, and uh, so for the moment, we have been studying only very, very special initial condition, step initial condition, or so-called weight initial condition in the height picture. But uh, the analysis can be extended to various cases. So for example, if we use, if we use this formula, so there is a nice parameter yj, right? So by change, so in here we only study the step initial condition case by putting yj to be minus j or something. But uh, maybe we can study other initial conditions. Uh, for example, one can study the alternate initial condition corresponding to flat initial condition for a surface picture. And in this case, we see GO in place even distribution, for example. And we could also try to study stationary case and so on. And uh, in fact, uh, this is also related to the, you know, the recent de development related to KPZ fixed point. By changing, even by changing this initial configurations, we see very universal behavior. So this is related to yeah, KPZ fixed point as well. And uh, so there's one exercise from yesterday, which is related to this Y dependence. Yeah. time, right? <laughs> okay, so from, <laughs> from here I wanted to go, to, so, so this is just a calculation, but uh, now we have a kind of better understanding how we should understand, so yeah, especially, particularly in this calculation, the determinant appears just as a consequence of calculations, but uh, now we have a better understanding why this kind of determinant appear. And I wanted to explain it today, but uh, now this is time to stop, so I have to postpone it to tomorrow, I think. Uh, thank you for your attention for today. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Yeah. Uh, can you also turn that into a determinant of the phase case? No. no. That's impossible. Oh, Only for the phase case. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's another way we can. Oh, yes, yeah. I will mention tomorrow. Uh, but n maybe not for AC, but at least for cases. Yeah. Uh, Q cases. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, so that's it for today.